pleasure to welcome uh, Chris Perez here today. He told me to keep it really short, so this is Chris Perez. <laughs> I think I know most of you, although uh, there's some, some new faces here that I've, that I've not seen before. But um, I thank you for welcoming me to the University of Maryland. Uh, what I would like to do here in today's presentation is give you a little bit of an overview of the programs that I currently manage at the National Science Foundation, the Engineering and Systems Design Program, and the Systems Science Program. The rather than, oh actually I have to move this slide, and I've been told so, and here's the, the slide that these views are mine and not necessarily the views of the National Science Foundation. Uh, but what, what I'd like to do is not just a boring presentation that tells you what the logistics of the program are and how much money we spend and how many of the folks get funded and so on and so forth. I thought it would be more interesting to give you a perspective on how I think about design and uh, what future directions there will be in, in the research for design, engineering design, and systems engineering. So that's what I would like to do. I'll start off by a short context here, setting uh, the scene, helping you understand a little bit more clearly where the programs fit into the NSF uh, hierarchy, uh, and then tell you a little bit of a story of design, as I mentioned. Tying this then to the organization of uh, the two programs. As you know, the, the two programs are actually relatively new. Christina Blubaum, my predecessor's predecessor, started these programs about two years ago. And uh, I think it's important that we communicate more clearly to the community now what the distinction is between the two programs and how they relate to the program that used to be there, which is the engineering design and innovation program. That's what I will, will try to do. Uh, so after this introduction, then I'll jump into a little bit more detail about the system science program and the engineering system design program uh, and, and handle any questions that you may have at the end. So let's get started. For those of you who are not familiar with uh, NSF, NSF is divided up into multiple directorates. And uh, the directorate that our programs are part of is the engineering directorate, which itself is divided into multiple dis divisions, where the technical divisions are really uh, CMMI, CPET, and PCCS, focusing on civil, mechanical, and manufacturing innovation, uh, chemical, bioengineering, environmental, and transport systems, and electrical communications with cyber systems. CMMI is where we belong, and administratively it's divided up into multiple clusters. This is administrative primarily. Uh, there is no really uh, any major uh, budgeting associated with at the cluster level. So in, in re really you can think of it as all of these programs belonging to CMMI directly. But within our cluster, we do have some concentration on systems work, uh, engineering and systems design, system science, sensors, dynamics, and control is a, is a new program uh, that is really three old programs rolled together, service enterprise systems, and operations research. These are the programs that uh, fit into the systems engineering design cluster. Is there the control program now? Is this over here? It's called SDC now. And it used to be three different programs that have been rolled combined. And uh, it's currently the two program directors uh, responsible for that program are Jordan Berg. So both of them are running the same program? Yes, Massimo Routine and, and Jordan, Jordan Berg are collaborating to manage that program. Yes. We have done the same with a few of other programs, for instance, in, in materials. We also have three program directors that manage one program. Um, so let me give you a little bit of background of how I think about the design. And I want to start here at, at, the, at the really at the beginning and ask why. I really like asking this question, why? Why do we design? Uh, and I think that in the design community we should really ask this question more often. Why do we do design the way we do it? So why do we design artifacts in the first place? Well, my argument is that it adds value, and that's the main reason why we do it. A couple of examples for this. If I'm an individual designer and I'm designing something for myself, then clearly I do so because I think that this new artifact will make my own life better, will make it easier, and it adds value to my own life. That's one scenario in which we design something for ourselves. The more common scenario is that I design something for others, 
And then uh, what really happens is that I design something with this ultimate user in mind, with the idea that what I create will add value to the life of the user, and that this user therefore will be willing to pay me something for this design artifact, such that in the end I also benefit myself. Right? So we create something with the user in mind, and then through trading, there is a consumer plus surplus and a producer surplus, and as a producer of the artifact, I gain by cashing in the, the uh, producer surplus. So we both benefit, but I'm doing the design because I care about the producer surplus. The, more, the final step here that I want to make is that we most often now design, not individually trading with the, the user, but in the context of an organization, in the context of a firm, and uh, in that case, the firm actually uh, nets the producer surplus and pays me as designer uh, a salary for doing the design work that I do. So, uh, and organizing in firms is, is beneficial for those of you who are studying the economics of organizations because it lowers this transaction cost. It's, it's, it's uh, less expensive to have long-term contracts than to renegotiate a contract in every time and so we can reduce this transaction cost by organizing ourselves in organizations. Now, in each of these three scenarios, ultimately, the designer benefits. And so I, would, I, I argue that we do design because uh, it adds value to the designer. It adds value to other people too, but I design because it adds value to myself. That's, my, that's a part of the motivation. I think it's important that we kind of have develop a, a common understanding. And I know that not everybody agrees with me on this, so if, there, if you have a, a different view, then I'll be happy to, to discuss this further. Okay, so uh, what do we mean by this word value when I say it adds value to me? Well, value is really an expression of preferences. Uh, the more preferred a particular outcome is, the higher the value that we assign to it. And uh, so it does not mean profit. This is one of the things that I want to emphasize. If you're a philanthropist, then you may assign a high value to an alternative that significantly increases well-being of others. And therefore, uh, even if, if it cannot produce as a, pro as a profit. So you know, if you create something that you give away, and you may actually create financially a loss, it may still add value to you because you care about the recipients, maybe a uh, community in another developed uh, part of the world that benefits tremendously from your, uh, from your philanthropic uh, endeavor. An environmentalist may assign high value to environmentally friendly or sustainable alternatives. And uh, the most common case, though, is where you're dealing with a publicly traded company and uh, the value in that context for that organization typically maps to uh, profit. You can express it in monetary terms uh, by looking at it in terms of, we, we call this pricing out, basically. If, you're, if you value uh, alternative A over B, then you're willing to trade A for B plus a certain, uh, you're willing to trade, sorry, exchange A for B plus a certain dollar amount which is the difference in the value between these two. So uh, just making sure that value, of, although it oftentimes is thought of in, in monetary terms, of, although it oftentimes is equated to profit, it doesn't have to be. I just want to emphasize that. Uh, so the overall process in summary here is that we need to understand our customers. How could their lives be improved? We then identify value opportunities. Where can a firm add value by creating something new? We design a new artifact, taking advantage of this value opportunity, and hopefully designing an artifact that can be produced for less than what the consumer is willing to pay. Uh, sell the artifact to the consumer. Here, one second, yeah. Sell the artifact to the consumer, and then we get paid by the firm. Yes? Yeah, do you look the difference between the customer and the user? Uh, there can be, yes. So it could be that there is more of a supply chain or a, a not supply chain, but on the other end, 
a distribution chain where we uh, sell to a wholesaler who then sells to a store and the store sells to the ultimate user. Uh, it, it, these, these are complicating factors that, that uh, do play a role, but ultimately uh, the end user is the one whose value we care about when we create, when we think about this value. So from Walmart, for example. Say that again? From Walmart. The, the customer or? The, 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 yeah, the customer from Walmart, the user from Walmart. That's right. We, as, a, as an organization, we may sell to Walmart, but Walmart then sells to the end user. Right. But how, how do you keep track of that, the notion of value when yeah. you have the, this intermediary between the end user and the, the, the design? Yeah, it just complicates things a little bit in the sense that there are multiple stakeholders now. It's not just a trade that occurs between the producer and the consumer but there are multiple additional stakeholders, all of which will need to get a portion of this overall surplus that exists. There's a value surplus, which is the difference between what the consumer is willing to pay and what it costs you to produce. The, re the difference between that needs to get divided up among the multiple stakeholders. Yeah. If, there is, if these stakeholders have a veto over the, over the deal, if they say, oh, I don't want to participate in this, then you'd better make sure that all of them have a positive value circle or portion of that surplus, otherwise it won't work. Right, I think there, there also might be situations where the, you know, the, besides the distribution chain, the, the person who purchases or makes that decision to purchase a system mm -hmm. is not the user of that system, right? Like at a university, yes. somebody buys the computers from the computer yeah. labs, but the students use the computers. Yeah, good point, good point. And in that case, I mean, from a producer's perspective, ultimately the person you need to convince of buying is the is the person who makes the purchasing uh, decision. Mm -hmm. you, you can think of the, yeah. even Walmart. You can think of Walmart being the agent for the customer. You know, they're they're well, they're providing it could go both ways. They also can be considered the agent for the producer, who mm -hmm. just pass it on and yeah, well, become part of the distribution chain. Time. Yeah. All right. Other questions? Good. So, designing, trading, organizing in firms, they all add value to the designers and to others too, but I, I'm emphasizing to the designer, I'm arguing that we do design because it adds value to us, the designers. Okay, so let's take a, uh, let's dig into this a little bit deeper. What I just mentioned basically is that we look for value opportunities, and then we create new artifacts that maximize our value. I didn't say maximize yet, but clearly if we care about obtaining value for ourselves, then it would be a good idea to do so more, most efficiently and to, to do so in, a, in an effective way, maximizing our own value. Uh, what's important to recognize here is that these value opportunities, they don't exist in a vacuum. What really happens is that they exist in a global context. And value opportunities are not constant, they come and they go. So for instance, uh, if we look at global climate change in, as part of our current environmental context, from an economic perspective, we are dealing with expensive and scarce fuel. Uh, from a technological perspective, we have pretty good batteries and motors available these days. And that creates a value opportunity now to create artifacts uh, that are fuel efficient electric vehicles. That's a value opportunity that exists today, but 15 years ago, maybe not. Because the batteries and the motors weren't as good, climate change was not as big of a deal as it is now, and uh, fuel was a whole lot less expensive than 15 years ago. So maybe another 10, 15 years, this value opportunity may no longer exist either, because some new technology has been developed. It may be that we're moving that to hydrogen-based fuel cells or something along those lines and, and uh, this, the current uh, uh, opportunity for fuel efficient electric vehicles may not be uh, in existence anymore. Soon as we create a new artifact, it also becomes part of this global context and uh, most likely the knowledge that we develop in the process will get uh, leaked to the competition, they will catch on and uh, before you know it, Competition also drives this evolutionary process over here, 
and the value opportunity may disappear because of competition. Or it could be just factors that are completely beyond our control in this global context that change the value opportunities. Okay. The argument that I'm making here is that in this global context, there is constant drive and constant value-driven process that leads to innovation, that leads to new artifacts. Now, the part that I've overlooked here is that going from a value opportunity to a new artifact doesn't happen just like that. It doesn't. It, it takes a process, right? And uh, so what we're basically doing in this process is we apply systems engineering and design. And as soon as I, as, we, as soon as we recognize that, now this also becomes part of the value argument. And just like there is an, there is a drive here, an evolution that happens at the systems level, there is also a drive and an evolution that is happening at the level of systems engineering and design as a process, as a as an endeavor itself. If we as an organization have better systems engineering and design capabilities, better than our competition, then there will be value opportunities that are accessible to us that are not accessible to our competition. So there's a competitive advantage by improving our uh, systems engineering and design capabilities. And so here also, there is a competitive value-driven drive to continuously improve our capabilities. Yeah. And this is, of course, where we come in as researchers, that we uh, can be instrumental in advancing the current state of the art in uh, systems engineering and design. Everybody with me so far? Yeah? Actually, I'm going to try to express this a little bit in mathematical terms. Uh, I was talking earlier with uh, Jeffrey that what I, what I think we need to do within our community is start moving towards models of design that are explanatory in nature. Models that help us to understand why we do design the way we do it. And um, with one of my students, uh, Ben Lee, I, I, I've been working on very, some very simple of such explanatory models. One way to think about design is that you could say, well, I'm going to search here uh, over the space of all possible artifacts, pretty much an infinite space, and I'm going to look for the artifacts that maximize the value. It turns out that this is a really bad model for design. Uh, well, first of all, it overlooks uncertainty, so a better way to frame this would be that we maximize the expected value of the utility of the, uh, the expected value of the utility of the value of the artifact, right? So here we take uncertainty into account. This, there, there are multiple ways to take uncertainty into account, but from a normative decision theory perspective, uh, this is, this is uh, uh, the normative way of, of handling this by taking the expected value of the utility. But still, this overlooks another important uh, aspect, which is that there, the process of solving this problem has costs associated with it. And so I would say that we should actually reformulate this problem in this way here, where we're saying, we're saying yes, there is a, a utility associated with the value, but there's also the cost of solving the search process in essence. We're searching through the space of alternatives, and searching requires time, and it requires resources, computational resources, organizational resources, human resources, so it requires some resources, and so therefore the value is affected by the time that it takes to produce the artifact and the cost associated with this search process. Now as soon as we write the problem in this way here, we actually uh, introduce a significant problem here. And that is that uh, there is self-reference now, that the optimization problem, or what looks like an optimization problem, isn't really an optimization problem anymore, because the objective depends on how we solve the problem. So the, the, the objective is no longer, in, in you know, optimization terms, a function that you're trying to find the maximum for, but the process for finding the maximum affects the objective. And so this now becomes a self-reference problem. And if, if you have ever studied self-referential problems, then you'll recognize that the complexity immediately goes through the roof as soon as you include self-reference. Uh, if you, there's a, a beautiful book that I enjoyed very much reading uh, 
by uh, Douglas Hofstadter, Bill Escherbach. Has anybody read that book? If you haven't, then, then you should definitely. It's a thick book, yeah. Uh, but but get, us, get started reading, and then uh, you can't put it down once you start reading. Okay. But so this is a, this is a significant problem. This actually, I think, complicates design tremendously. What's the unit of cost there? Um, some commodity that we care about. So it yes. doesn't matter. We can use dollars. Right. So the question that comes to mind, value doesn't have any unit. Cost has some unit. So how do you, can you subtract those uh, two? Yeah, but earlier I was expressing that uh, value can also be monetized. Okay. And so uh, as soon as we monetize it, then we are dealing with the same units. So why, uh, okay. so why uh, further up in that second line, why do you call it utility of value? Why not utility of that alternative? Because value usually, yep. notion of value is, as you said, doesn't have, it doesn't account uh, for I safety. guess I guess what, I, what I'm arguing here is that uh, if, if, uh, if you're monetizing things and expressing the value of an alternative in, uh, let's say, dollars, no. then we can ex express our risk preferences by applying a nonlinear transformation from dollars, wealth, to utility. And uh, in one step, by just ask, adding on this nonlinear transformation and then the expected value operator, we can take risk preferences into account. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Uh, have you put inside the error uh, of a function, I mean, the the, the, the estimation of, uh, of, of the error that you can have in order to be uh, uh, more close the estimated value to the real value. Uh, and in this way, for well, example, you, you are capturing uncertain. also the, 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 the uncertainty. Yeah, everything within. is uncertain, right? So I'm not yeah. sure. Uh, it's not that there is an error. We should mm -hmm. think about it as just uncertainty. Mm -hmm. uh, error the, the applies uh, to the an measurement theory. Yeah. It doesn't apply in this context. We're making predictions about some future. We're expressing our beliefs about the future. And so it's not meaningful to talk about an error in those terms because the future hasn't occurred yet and cannot be measured. So think about it in terms of expressing our beliefs about something that will happen in the future. I'm sorry. Okay. But this actually leads to some interesting things here that there, there, there is a, uh, an infinite regress involved. You know, let's say you say, whoa, uh, we can solve this problem by formulating it uh, as a decision and uh, we can formulate what the objective is and then maximize this objective. Uh, but then the question becomes, well, how should you frame this decision problem? Well, there's, we can have multiple choices. We can consider multiple alternatives. We can look at models of, of these alternatives that uh, uh, at different levels of abstraction, different levels of accuracy. So there's multiple ways in which we can formulate that decision. How should you formulate the decision? Well, in such a way that maximizes value. Okay, so why don't we create a decision problem that helps us to decide how to formulate the decision problem? And then we can say, well, how do you formulate that decision problem? And you go into an infinite regress where you need to decide how to decide, how to decide, how to decide, how to maximize the value of the artifact. So uh, this, this causes some problems. Another way of looking at this, though, where, the in, where this self-reference disappears, is to look at it in terms of process, where we say, well, what we really are looking for is the best process for design, and the artifact is just the outcome of the process. So uh, it looks like the exact, same, the exact same expression, except that now the artifact becomes part of the process, uh, is the outcome of the process, the time is a the, is the result of the process, and the cost is a result of the process. That's the only change that I made to this equation. Uh, it's no longer self-referential, right? The, the, the script P does not appear, but of course, uh, it's still very challenging because now, uh, we cannot optimize in advance. Every step of the process pr reveals new information that will affect how what we do in, the, in subsequent steps. And so now it becomes a dynamic problem, uh, which I, I guess remains more or less equally 
challenging. It's just that we have formulated it mathematically differently. Uh, how do you how do you relate this to traditional uh, design processes like okay. system engineering? Yeah. Uh, actually, I, I will. I'll come, I'll come to that in just a second. For the traditional design processes and systems engineering processes, they are just good search heuristics. They are heuristics that we use and we say, oh, in general, it's a good idea to start by formulating the problem, identifying where there's a value opportunity, creating maybe a functional decomposition, and so on and so forth. Right? The, the steps that we typically go through, they are heuristics. They are heuristics that we think lead to near optimal solutions to this problem. Okay. I, I think in general we should think about it not as a fixed process or the way it's currently often formulated, but it should really be reflect this dynamic nature and, and I, I, I like to express that by calling it a search strategy. Not just a process, but a strategy. And the part of the strategy is to discover what the process should be. Yeah? Uh, another important part here is that we're making trade-offs now between artifact value and this overall search time and cost. So here's the value and there's the cost and the choice of the process that we make actually affects both of them. So we need to make a trade-off. Sometimes it's a good so idea. Can you give me a term here about market opportunity? You know, for example, suppose it's like television. Yeah. It's a lot easier for me to sell you the first television than it is to sell you the second television. Even if my, even if the first television is Yeah. Microsoft is a brilliant yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So, so should, you know, I mean. Yeah, I, I've left that implicit, <coughs> but this value would account for that. Basically, your search, your marketing strategy uh, will be affected, will affect the value of, of the artifact. But at this point, we're doing design, and the, the choice of the marketing strategy influences design maybe to some extent, but oftentimes that's in this, that is handled primarily in a subsequent phase. Right, but even if you did, no one's going to design something so that the last bit will be there, yeah. and then they completely missed the market opportunity. It might be brilliant from an engineering standpoint, but from an okay. standpoint, yeah. it's right. Yeah, so that, from that perspective here, what, what, what that is accounted for by this time dependence here, if the value, uh, if it takes longer to develop the product, then the value will drop off. And at some point it will drop off very significantly. You know, if your competition, if, you, if it takes you so long to develop that the competition beats you to it, then the market share will drop off and so right. the value of the artifact goes to zero. Right? right? So that's accounted for in, in this time dependence over here. Okay? Um, the final step in this is that the value of the artifact actually is not only determined just by the process, but also by the organization that performs the process. And so really, strictly speaking, we should also consider optimizing the organization such that the people are appropriately, have all of the information and knowledge necessary and are appropriately, uh, appropriately incentivized to perform a process that leads to artifacts that are valuable. I guess it's get complicated. Yeah. Just a quick uh, comment. Shouldn't cost also be a fu uh, function of time? But that also over time might change. Um, I'm not, I don't see how exactly how that would work. Once the cost? Yeah, cost can be also dynamic uh, because there might be some factors uh, that over time might change. Yeah, but once I perform a process step, I incur a cost, and that cost, once it's been incurred, will not change anymore, right? So it's a direct consequence of performing a process step. It, I agree that we may have, our predictions of future costs may change over time, but the cost is directly tied to a particular process step. Yeah. Okay, you, well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, for the, the organization side, you mentioned that uh, uh, how do you really consider some conflict of interest among different organizations? Uh, let's say a customer might have uh, different interests for their company. Ah, yeah, yeah. So if there are other stakeholders involved besides the ones within your organization, then you need to take their actions into account. 
but you only care about stakeholders to the extent that their actions can affect your value. So the stakeholder, the other stakeholders will affect your value, right? And the, as soon as there are other stakeholders involved, this really becomes a game theory problem. It's not only a, it's already a game theoretic problem in the, in the context of the organization itself, but also from the perspective of other stakeholders involved. They influence your value and you influence their actions and uh, you, it, it turns into a game theory. So problem. this optimization will be just the, the searching strategy for one failures. That's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but strictly speaking, I agree with you that you need to take the actions of the other players into account and they will affect your value. And where is the summation coming from for the... The summation here, uh, it actually was intended to be across all of the uh, people within your organization that you incentivize. We should take this out. So basically, within an organization, part of, of uh, uh, the search strategy within organizations is to decompose the work, delegate, but then you also need to provide re remuneration and, and incentivation. I was just not seeing the submission as being done. Not, it's not being done over all, but that's what the Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's done over the individuals within the organization. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, Chris, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I changed it this morning and didn't do it so carefully. So, yeah. in this context, uh, I, I don't know the answer to this, that's yeah. why I'm asking you. So, if if you put this in the context of games, yeah. I know that in game theory, you know, the objective functions have to be, uh, you know, some value that uh, uh, that you can compare, etc., on a ratio scale. But now you have ordinal scale. How does this would fit in the context of game theory? Where do you see in other words, where the objective function is mm -hmm. nominal? Uh, as cardinal escape. Excuse but it should be, it's, I assume it to be cardinal, that you can express this in a cardinal scale, not ordinal. So how do you put this in the context of ordinal because you have utility? Yeah. No, utility is cardinal. cardinal. So we're not comparing rankings, but we're comparing actual differences in value. So this is cardinal. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you have any kind of strategy to actually formulate the utility in a cardinal way because you said earlier it was an expression of preferences yeah. and that would change from one individual to another, from one organization to another and if you take into account okay. the complexity of the other players, the competition or things like that. Yeah, we need to be a little bit careful actually. The preferences are actually not that different from one organization to the other. Most organizations like money, the more the better. Right? So the preferences are actually relatively simple. What is challenging is predicting what the profit will be. And so this is where we have a very complex model and, and we definitely need more research to help us develop, with, develop approaches that help us to predict what this value is. Currently, people do not do this in, in practice because they don't know how, how to uh, come up with these models. I think at the at the higher at the business level at the enterprise level, people do use some rudimentary models, but it's not so easy to uh, transform this into objectives that can be dealt with at the at the engineering level. I don't get me wrong, right? I'm not suggesting that we actually solve this type of problem mathematically. This is just ridiculous that solving this thinking about all possible organizational structures, all possible processes, but from a mathematical perspective, from a, a conceptual uh, perspective, I, I do think, at least it helped me to think more clearly about where we're coming from in design. Uh, and what I want to emphasize with this slide here is that organizational structure is an important part of the, the design problem. We have to consider organization when we study design. Without it, we are missing out on an important component of this overall problem. All right, taking a little bit more time than I intended here. So uh, let's, I'm going to go a little bit more quickly here. Um, where, where do the systems, the systems uh, science and the engineering systems design programs now fit in? If you look at this definition that I pulled off the web, 
from the engineering and uh, engineering design and, inno and innovation program several years ago, and you read this, that actually matches more or less what we're currently after, still almost almost identically. The only difference that has occurred really is that we have introduced this notion of system. System, system, it, it appears in the name of both of the programs now. And so this is really the major shift that has happened. The program used to be focused primarily on mechanical design, some aerospace, some architecture. But uh, I think that in, over time we have to move towards a broader perspective that deals with the design of complex engineering systems. Complexity as expressed in involving multiple disciplines, multiple stakeholders, multiple concerns, complex interactions, uncertain outcomes, and so on and so forth. However you want to define complexity, if, if, there, if there is ultimately some measurable, uh, some way of measuring complexity, it would involve some combination of these, I would expect. The second aspect is that we need to uh, explicitly take into account a holistic perspective. Uh, that all of the aspects that ultimately influence how much we prefer a certain outcome should be considered. Uh, and you know, if your focus is on profit, then profit is still influenced by societal, environmental, uh, uh, economical, and, and political aspects. So all of that needs to be considered. Uh, unless we start moving in this direction, I think we will become irrelevant. So. Mechanical engineering colleagues, I think we really need to think more broadly beyond uh, traditional mechanical engineering. Um, actually, I'm going to skip over this, this, this slide in the interest of time. Let me bring it back to this slide that I started with, uh, that I ended with earlier, uh, and let's ask ourselves how can we influence and advanced systems engineering and design. And there are several ways in which we can do this. One way is to focus on the theoretical foundation of systems engineering and design. And building a better theoretical foundation, helping us better understand why we do design and systems engineering the way we do it, and hopefully improve it by gaining that deeper understanding. The second aspect, the way in which we can improve uh, systems engineering and design, is by taking into account domain knowledge more effectively. And given a particular global context, we can often improve uh, design by taking that context into account, by taking the domain knowledge and, and making that part of our overall systems engineering design process. And finally, uh, by taking advantage of new enabling technologies. Enabling technologies such as high performance computing, uh, visualization technologies, communication technologies, uh, social networking technologies, and so on and so forth. These technologies, as they advance and as they become available, will definitely influence the best way to do the systems engineering and design, and we should take those into account. Finally, none of this would really matter unless we actually make it part of our practice, and so education and training uh, becomes an important part of, of our overall strategy for advancing systems engineering and design also. The interesting part is that this actually aligns very well with the programs that we have at MSF. Uh, the theoretical foundation is the focus of the systems science program, and the three other components, primarily these two components, uh, fit within the engineering and systems design program. And this is how I make the distinction. Theoretical foundations in a fashion that is domain independent, belongs in system science. Once we add in the domain, or add in focus on, on enabling technologies, then it, become, it becomes part of engineering systems design. So let's take a closer look at the system science program. Um, in our current practices in systems engineering and design, we're all familiar with phases of the design process, different steps that we go through, but I would argue that we don't really understand why we do the things the way we do them. And uh, ultimately, I would say that we need to trace these practices down to some theoretical foundations here. There are foundations that, in disciplines that have been developed previously that are clearly relevant, 
to systems engineering and design, ranging from the more mathematical to the more human-focused uh, disciplines. And they all can inform. And by integrating these, uh, we can gain a better understanding for systems engineering and design. And this is really the focus of the system science program, is to develop this theoretical foundation for systems engineering and design. Integrating these additional uh, existing disciplines into something that then is both rigorous and pragmatic. And this is the problem. This is actually maybe where uh, the program, as it was defined by some of my predecessors, uh, needs need some adjustment in my mind, is that uh, rigor is important, but unless we turn this into something pragmatic that can be applied on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, it will not have any impact. We cannot expect all our designers to be decision uh, theory specialists. It, that's not the, the, the best way forward. Okay? It needs to be rigorous and pragmatic. Um, so, summarizing the role of the program here is leadership in grounding systems engineering and design practice on a rigorous theoretical foundation uh, in an application domain independent fashion with a special, special emphasis on complex engineered systems. Uh, so, we will definitely draw on a, a set of existing theories, uh, but empirical research is also in, in scope of the program uh, when it is used to characterize a certain theoretical model. You know, if we propose a theoretical model and we need to go through some process of uh, assessing whether this theoretical model actually is true or is relevant in, in our context, and we need to therefore go through a characterization process that is based on empirical research. Um, some examples of Ongoing projects or future projects in, in uh, system science deal with knowledge representation, ideation and cognition, uh, uncertainty and uh, prediction, engineering decision making, engineering organizations. I'm not going to read over all of these questions. Uh, the slides I think will be made available to you, and uh, uh, we can. You can read over these uh, afterwards on that revision. In terms of setting the future directions, I've actually divided it up into four different emphasis areas within the program. Uh, one is on processes, where I want to emphasize this notion of having developing a search strategy, uh, maybe with a guidance and, and control feedback loops on top of the process, assessing where we are in an overall search strategy, and based on our assessment of where we are so far, provide uh, input on where how to proceed next. And this is quite different, I think, from what has been traditionally studied. If I look at the engineering design and systems engineering literature, then oftentimes people will say, oh, simple, it's an optimization problem. Here's the objective function, and I can come up with a better way of solving this uh, optimization problem that results in. But that is at best one step in an overall search process, which is really a sequence of steps that we go through, a sequence of optimizations, a sequence of decisions that we make. And talking about the quality of one problem formulation, one decision in that step, without considering what came before or what follows, I don't think is meaningful. We really need to ask ourselves, is this the right abstraction that we're considering at a given step? Are we using the right uh, abstract, uh, accuracy of our predictive models and so on and so forth? So let's look at this really from a search strategy and position these problems in this broader context. Second part is uh, organizations. Uh, this deals with how do we decompose problems and delegate within decisions, within organizations. How do we communicate within these organizations? How do we uh, explain to the people to whom we delegate what needs to occur? Uh, how do we share information and knowledge in general? And how do we incentivize them? Uh, all three of these aspects, I think, uh, need to be studied in more detail. So far, these are problems that are probably under-researched within our community. The third area of emphasis is on modeling. How do we create, use, and assess models? Models are ubiquitous within our discipline. 
without models, we wouldn't be able to design many of the things that we design right now. And from a search strategy perspective, it's an effective way of actually searching. So they're there to stay, but I, I, I would uh, uh, encourage people to study modeling in and of itself more carefully. How do we create models? How do we do this? I mean, clearly we are humans who are doing this. Maybe we need to study how humans, what the mental processes are for creating models. One example. How do we use models? People oftentimes, I, I've seen this many times, where they just put a bunch of simulation models together, find it all in code, together with some differential algebraic equations, together with a discrete element model. They somehow tie it together with some glue code and hope that something good comes out of it. We really need to understand this better, and uh, some further research in that area will be good. Finally, final topic here is on research methodology. I think that all the design researchers agree with each other that we need to improve design. We want to improve design. But I would say that we don't really agree on what good means at this point. How do we assess goodness in design? If we want to improve it, Shouldn't we at least have some understanding of what we mean by goodness? Uh, how do we measure that goodness? If once we agree, we need to still be able to measure it. So I think that there's opportunity for improvement and, and uh, advancing what we currently do by focusing on these certain methodology. All right, so this was system science. Let's switch over to engineering and systems design. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, once we introduce engineering and systems design, we switch from the theoretical foundation in a domain independent fashion to a specific context. And within this context, then we come up with context specific approximations of this theory, in which we include domain knowledge and uh, we come up with the appropriate approximations. We operationalize this theoretical foundation in, in this each, each uh, specific context which consists of both uh, you know, a context that uh, uh, is, deals with the system itself, you know, increasing complexity of the system, shorter life cycles, decentralization systems of systems, and so on and so forth, but also with how we do systems engineering and design. So cloud-based, high-performance computing, big data, versus visualization, net-enabled collaboration. These are different ways in which we do these systems engineering. Both of these combined provide a context, and then within that context, we can ask the question, how do we best support systems engineering and design in that context? Which architectural patterns should be used? Which formalisms and fidelity should be used for our analysis models? Uh, from a process perspective, when should we do what, in which order, in which sequence? And from an organizational perspective, who should do these different steps, and how do people communicate with each other? So let me illustrate this, make this a little bit more concrete with an example. Let's assume that we're going to create some decision support tool for X, design for X. You may, you make it up. I mean, let's pick a popular one these days, maybe. Design for additive manufacturing, right? Design for additive manufacturing. What does that mean? Well, if you're going to create a decision support tool, I hope that you at least have some decision model also supporting that tool. That you don't do something completely ad hoc, but that we actually have a decision model for this for this context X, which is based on some foundation, uh, hopefully involving economics, probability theory, decision theory. These are these definitely seem to be relevant in this context. Now in order to actually develop so this is this is so far we've talked really about system science, right? We're looking at this in a very generic way. So now we're going to turn it into an engineering and systems design context by including domain knowledge, which means that in our decision model, we will consider specific heuristics for which architectures to consider, specific idealizations for analysis models, uncertainty characterizations, and so on and so forth. We're now making this concrete and including this domain knowledge. One step beyond this even is that we need to consider what information and communication technologies we can use to build this tool? What are some of these enabling technologies that we can use in the development of the tool itself? And uh, as soon as we start focusing on the tool, we also need to consider the user of the tool and include the psychological aspect there. 
Uh, maybe one step further is that we also consider the organization and take the, into account the sociological aspect where the tool is not just used by one user, but by multiple people within the organization. Well, I think that organizational structure aspect is very important because this decision, whatever that design for X thing yeah. is, is part of it of a larger decision-making system where there's yeah. people who make other decisions, and you make your decision, and other people make downstream decisions. Yes, 100% with you. Yeah, it's very important. Uh, these, from the search perspective, is not just one individual decision, but it, it could be decisions in a sequence and decisions that happen in parallel about different parts of the overall system. Okay. Uh, let's see. So. The focus of the program here is on advancing engineering system design practices for current and future global context by combining rigor and pragmatism. Uh, an important part of the fact that we're using approximations or heuristics in a specific context is that these heuristics are not universally applicable anymore. And we better identify when they are good and when they are not. So let's not only create heuristics, but also characterize uh, when these methods and models and tools are appropriate to be used. And finally, education, which yeah, is not the main focus of the program, but I definitely want to encourage uh, people to also study how we best teach engineering and systems design uh, using the current, in the current context uh, within our current educational system. Uh, some examples for future directions. Design for X is always uh, a popular area. Lots of proposals get submitted for design for X. But I want to put one, a caveat in here that when X is not an application domain with a specific concern, you need to be a little bit careful, I think. I get a lot of proposals that deal with design for, let's say, sustainability, for instance. And uh, if we come up with methods and tools that focus on sustainability, increase the sustainability of the system at the detriment of others, other characteristics, other concerns, then we need to be careful. That is not necessarily a good idea. So I would encourage you to think about design for X where X is a concern, to frame the problem holistically, look at many concerns, but then ask yourself the question, how can, what is the impact of having additional emphasis on one of these concerns? But always in this holistic context. Uh, novel information and communication technologies. So, I mean, there's a whole list of different technologies that we're likely to, to benefit from in the context of engineering and systems design. Uh, novel modeling formalisms and algorithms. Uh, there's always room for innovation, new ways of representing information and knowledge, and for uh, processing, computing, making inferences, reasoning with, these, with that information. And finally here, uh, from a perspective of integration, uh, there's also I think a need for novel integrated frameworks that uh, if we look at just as one optimization problem, uh, we are selling ourselves short. All of these individual formalisms and algorithms somehow need to be integrated with each other and integrated also with humans that become part of this overall system for uh, designing uh, new systems. Finally, I will emphasize this one more time that whatever we do, we better rigorously characterize and uh, assess these methods so that we understand when they are applicable and what their performance is for. A few last words here very quickly about logistics. I hope that not too many people missed the deadline this year, but we shifted the deadline forward, so the deadline for, uh, for our submission window is now September uh, 1 through 15. Typical scope of proposals within the program is one to two PIs, one to two PhD students, three years total. If I add this up, for most people, that comes down to up to half a million dollars for per proposal. If you go significantly above half a million for an individual uh, proposal, then uh, you're taking your risk. I'm I'm looking at this from a risk management perspective, and if I'm going to spend that much money 
or propose that, that we spend that much money on one project, it better be really, really good. You know how it works with NSF. Uh, once the money has been allocated, there's actually very little control that NSF has over how the money is spent. So if we have a large budget, then we better make sure that it's a, that it's a really solid investment. Uh, so I encourage you from your own perspective uh, to, to stay at, at, at less than half a million. For career proposals, the budget has also been updated to half a million, half a million exactly for those of you who are going to submit next year. Um, if you're interested in being a panelist, send me a quick email so that I can keep track of who, who uh, is interested and uh, I will add you to my list of panelists. An important part of a systems engineering design is that we do collaborate with people who focus on specific application domains. And there is a large number of, of additional pro pro uh, programs at NSF that you should be aware of and that allow you to actually uh, gain additional funding sources. Uh, for instance, recently we had the, the, the new solicitation called RSB, Decision Framework for Multi-Hazard Resilient and Sustainable Buildings. And uh, there were quite a few people from the design community, systems engineer community, who teamed up with uh, structural engineers and architects in order to submit to, to this particular call. Similarly, for cyber-physical systems and uh, computational and data net enabled science and engineering is another program. INSPIRE is, is uh, a program that some of you may not be familiar with. Uh, it's actually a program that is still evolving, but uh, it requires that uh, you do research, that propose research that is transformative and uh, interdisciplinary in nature. It requires that you contact in advance two program directors in substantially different disciplines and have approval from them in advance before you submit them. But it's definitely an opportunity that you should look into. And uh, I've uh, already communicated with some of my counterparts in uh, social behavioral and economic sciences that we will seriously look at proposals that deal with design that have linkages to organizational theory and to content design. Okay, so I'll put this slide up as a summary slide and open it up for questions. I I will make it available, yes. Thank you. Seems that these two programs in systems have some significant overlap and I imagine that you might be getting proposals that might mean for one but actually is the other or vice versa. Is that true? Um, it is true that that happens at this point actually very often, uh, but that is in part due to the fact that the synopses that are posted online at this point are still very confusing. I hope that this presentation will shed a little bit more light on where your proposal may go, if it's really fundamental theoretical research in systems engineering and design that is domain independent, then it should go to system science. Otherwise, it should go to engineering and systems design. But the same one can think of topics that yep. is yep. overlapping. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but so in, in that case, if you if you really struggle, give me a call and we can talk about it. And oftentimes, what what is possible too is that you actually submit it to both programs. You, you're not restricted to submitting it to one program. You can submit it to both programs. Or you could actually think about situations also where you submit to system science, but your application domain may be in service enterprise systems mm. or into civil infrastructure systems. And then you can submit to, to uh, both programs. Same proposal? Same proposal gets submitted to both programs. And then I will interact with the other program directors uh, to see whether there's an opportunity for co-funding. If the PIs get it wrong, then we try to help them out, and we may actually re reassign the proposal to a, a more appropriate program. Sometimes that, that doesn't work out. I mean, sometimes we get proposals that are really uh, more appropriate for uh, 
if, 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 it, if it belongs to a program outside CMMI, and we want to reassign it to some program that is outside CMMI, they have different deadlines and, and uh, different proposal submission windows. Reassigning becomes often impossible then, and in which case we will need to send it back without review. The second question is, given the budget cut at the federal government level, DOD, NASA, etc., I imagine you get the NSF number of proposals have gone up quite a bit. Am I correct? And if that is so, what is the acceptance rate of this program in the last couple well, of I, years? Well, I, I wish the, the number of proposals in these programs would go up. It's actually low at this point, mm -hmm. and I, 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 yes, it's surprising to me too. So I've actually dealt with two submission windows not now, the, the submission window last spring, and uh, now this fall, and I'm, I was surprised about the small number of proposals. Uh, overall, the success rate uh, is similar to what it is for all of NSF, basically. You know, between 10 and 15 percent. If the way it works is that it's a self-regulating system, if the success rate goes up, more people submit, and it, and it levels out, so it becomes a self-regulating system, and somehow we always end up with a, a success rate of between 10 and 15 percent. And how does the budget of this program compare to other uh, other programs uh, in CMMI or that cluster? Uh, it's it's actually so we're on the order of about eight million dollars. Each each of those. No, 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 the two combined. Okay. Yeah. Which is larger than most programs. Mm -hmm. There's some. I mean, now that we have combined programs, let's say the materials programs, they all combine into one program. That is now, of course, much larger. Than uh, you have but they also get many more times more proposals than we do. So again, the success rate remains around 10-15%. Around, uh, 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 we have a uh, distribution on how, how much, how, what percentage goes to the career or what is the percentage goes to the regular proposal? Um, um, last year was somewhat exceptional. We made, we made three career awards. Okay. Uh, yeah, this uh, year, this year, I'm not sure how many career awards there will be. Career awards are dealt quite they are dealt with quite differently. They are actually made by the division, not by the individual programs. Oh, so is it, it's beyond the budget, basically, or it's still within the budget? Um, it's still within the budget, but I, all of the program directors have a voice in deciding which which career proposals get done. It's not, uh, it's not a recommendation made by a program, individual program director. No, I was just wondering whether the budget of the 8 million is per cycle. You have two windows per year. Is it for one year? One year. For two cycles? Yes. Yeah, so I, I'm basically from a civil engineer, but we do yeah. also some of the design issues. And uh, thank you very much for an excellent presentation here. So, uh, sometimes we do have some kind of uh, ideas that we really wonder whether fit into your program or yeah. not. So uh, what is the suggestion that we have? Like, uh, you know, I, I have some idea, and I really want to really know whether it fits your, uh, into your program. Or not. Yeah. Just to contact you and see. Communicate, yeah. Okay. But uh, to make the communication go smoothly, the preferred way of doing this is to write up your idea in one okay. page. One page and summary. Then, yeah. yeah. So similar to the project summary that you would submit in your proposal, it helps you to clarify exactly what it is that you want to focus on. And rather than talking on the phone for half an hour so that you can explain it to me, if I can read over this one page description, then I will be able to ask more direct questions and help you uh, identify where it should go. And maybe give you feedback on how to improve the idea or uh, yeah, how to fit it, make it fit better with the program. Other questions?
Thank you. Thank you.